Chapter 13, Macroeconomic Policy, Part 2. Part 2, Part 2. So Part 2 will not make any sense if you have not seen the Part 1. So please, please look at Part 1. In this Part 2, we're going to learn and continue to figure out what's going on in the mind of a Federal Reserve Chairman, right? So we saw how they have dual mandate in Part 1, and we ended Part 1 with Taylor, Taylor's Rule. Taylor's rule is R equals 2.0 plus half of inflation gap plus half of output gap. 2.0 is basically nothing but the average historical rate. So we also know I equals R plus pi, right? We know this. So now if we substitute R, in this equation here, and I is basically the real federal fund rate. This is what the Federal Reserve controls. They control I, and that influences R, which is the real interest rate. So in a sense, I becomes R plus pi, and R is this. So I equals inflation rate plus historical average real fund rate plus half of inflation gap plus half of output gap. So this is our historical federal fund rate. So we, we built this Taylor's rule, which, which can actually give us this formula as to how should the Federal Reserve set I so that it influences R, right? Now we have this equation, I equals pi plus 2.0 plus half of pi minus pi t plus half of y minus y t output gap, weighted average with uh, inflation gap historical Fed rate and inflation. So Federal, Federal Reserve will use this equation, most likely, I don't know for sure, but the text says that Bernanke and Alan Greenspan use this Taylor's rule, because if you look at the historical graphs of how they changed the interest rate and what was the output gap, what was the inflation gap, then it actually follows very closely. So let's take an example. Let's say today inflation target that the Federal Reserve tells that, hey, my target is 2%. And today, actually, the inflation is 3%, and the output gap is 1%. Then you can say, hey, if I plug all of this into this equation, I get, hey, I should be setting my interest rate at 6%, which is 3, inflation plus 2, plus half of 3 minus 2, plus half of 1, right? So this will be 0 0.5, 0 0.5, so that's 3, and then 3, 6, right? So we get interest rate. It tells us how to control R. Taylor's rule tells us how to control R with using I, the federal fund rate. But the Taylor's principle gives us a general indication of like how real interest rate and inflation behave with this MP curve, right? So there's a difference there, slight nuance. We went into the Taylor's rule. This was from the last class. So let's continue what new things we will learn in this one, right? We're going to learn two new things outside of the Taylor's rule. One is, what is the reason? What is better? Is it active Federal Reserve, active policy making, active changes is better? Or, and, or is it, you know, we should just have the classical where it should be passive, non-activist? And the second is, like, when, when the interest rate hits zero, 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 when interest rate hits zero, like, can the monetary policy still do anything? Can the people at the Federal Reserve, are they like gonna give up? Because for the last many years, interest rate has been zero. So we're gonna learn about what happens when interest rate actually goes down to zero. So let's look at some of the examples of the lags in the system. So today, when, when the policymakers, the Federal Reserve, let's say, decides, or even the government decides that, hey, we're gonna have this fiscal stimulus, or we're gonna change this monetary policy, right? It takes time. There is a lag. There is a data lag just to capture the data as to how does unemployment is a survey that goes out. It takes like months for that data to come out, right? So there is inflation. Also, there is the CPI and many calculations that need to happen. And there's a lag in that data. And there's also some aspect of accuracy of that data. So once you don't get the data instantaneously, you can't really say United States today at this moment is X percent unemployment and X percent national unemployment and X frictional unemployment. You can't really do that with high level of accuracy. So that's a flaw that we have to take into account. 
there's also a recognition gap. Once you get the data, it also gets you know revised multiple times. So the accuracy already was a little bit you know iffy, but now it's going to be revised multiple times. And by the time it's revised, you see patterns. It's already a lag. This is a recognition lag. And then once you realize, oh, there's a problem, then you want to act. When you act, then you know you have to pass policies and you have to make changes. It takes time. You know, even the Federal Reserve only meets once in six weeks. Right. So even the fastest monetary policy, like, you know, they, they make a decision once every six weeks. Right. So the government, like there's various phases. So that's even longer. So the policy making legislation even longer. And then once you decide, oh, this is a problem, we recognize it. Oh, we, we, got to, we are all in consensus. Let's go build it. Right. And let's, let's go do this. And then this is going to be an implementation lag. It takes time to implement. So by the time it's implemented and it actually reaches people, it's already like way too late. And so then there is an effectiveness measure lag. Like you don't really know, is this working? Was this effect of something 10 years ago, five years ago, or like what's going on? So because of all of these, there's, this can, all of these lags can also be a pro, but also can be a major con for activist policy making, where the government should come in, intervene and act. They could just be acting in the hindsight, right? So it's still not very clear to me Right, like what policy is better, active or non-active? But these lags make me indicate that non-active is actually pretty worse. But you can also say the active is worse because you're actually making things worse. So which one's better? And what the Federal Reserve is actually doing is that's where there is a human judgment. Otherwise, you know, you could say, hey, this Taylor's rule exists, just, just autopilot this. Anytime there's a problem, you know, you, you have interest rate change, just automatic interest rate reduction. That's why there's this human judgment involved. That's why we have this Federal Reserve. That's why we have a chairman. That's why we have a board of committee that decides on like various factors that are going in as to what is the state of the economy. And due to these lags, I think active, if I were to pick one, I would say active policy making has a much higher stabilization function. And it also challenges the status quo. It, it gets you to think better, gets you to reduce all of these lags. But if it's passive, it's like you're not active as usual. It's like the whims of like uh, whatever happens, right? So. Taylor's rule can't be put on autopilot because of the reasons that I shared. And I believe active is a much better policy and to continuously make these lags go down, make the system better is, is the way to go. So now, what are the types of inflation? Right? There are two types of inflation. There's a cost push inflation and there's a demand pull inflation. Right? So remember, inflation happens for multiple reasons and these are the two big ones cost push is basically let's say you are an employee at a company and you say hey i deserve to get paid more and so what do you do you go talk to your boss and your boss is like okay yes konal you deserve to get paid more so then they pay me more but what if what if i'm just saying what if what if my contribution was slightly lower than what the employer paid me right in that case you know they they're not getting the return then that's a problem right and so then what happens is, you know, I, the supply will go from AS1 to AS2. It's a negative supply shock for the employer, right? Because I say they gave me $100, I, I could only give them back $99, let us say for whatever reason. And what's happening is there's a negative supply shock of a $1, right? Because, you know, the, the employee, employer didn't get the dollar extra that they should have actually from the efficiency gain of my work. So in that case, what happens is my supply curve goes from AS1 to AS2. It's a negative supply shock. So with that, what happens is the demand curve stays the same, AD1 and AS1. So at here, we have inflation. But what happens when there's a negative supply shock, AS1 goes to AS2. And so then 0.1 goes to 0.2 here. So inflation goes up, right? And, and at that point, the output will be lower, right? Because I just gave one output lower than what the employer credited me. And so then what will happen is I'll realize, oh, I do act more. So I'll go act more. And so what happens is my output gets back here. But then at that time, the, the demand will, will go up as well. So it will go from 0 0.2 to 0 0.3. So in a sense, what happened is 0 0.2 didn't go back to 0 0.1, 0 0.2 went to 0 0.3, right? So that's the, that's the key. Because my demand, my, my wage has already gone up. And so the employer, uh, my sub AS curve from AS1 went to AS2. And then my demand also went up, right? So inflation continues to be on the spiral hike up. And that is cost push inflation. 
And that is when the supply actually triggers the inflation. That is cost push inflation. When the supply curve has a negative shock that leads to uh, the, the demand curve having, having a negative shock, right? So that, that, that is a negative spiral. And you can imagine this just keeps going up. Similarly, an opposite, where in the demand side of the equation has, has a demand side pull of an inflation. What, when, when does this happen? This happens when the economy is overheating or when the monetary policy are like so loose and easy that you know there's free money available. So what happens then is the demand goes up because people are ready to take more uh, interest. Uh, they, 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 wanna, they wanna buy more goods and services. The demand side pushes up. So then point one goes up to point two. And so similarly, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm expecting more. And so then the supply follows, right? Because it, the output here at this point is uh, Y2 is greater than the YP, which is my potential. So then it'll, it'll try to come back. It's like, hey, Y2 can't be sustainable. Like, you know, if, even, even if you hire a lot more people, make them work like 24 seven, you can do that for a temporary period of time. That's what this is. Economy is overheating. You are doing more than your potential and then you'll come back. But when you come back, you know, you, you will not come back from two to one, you go from two to three. So the inflation just keeps going up. Pi one, pi two, pi three. So this is basically the demand pull inflation because the demand was the one that triggered the, the supply to go up as well, right? So these are two different types and each one of them can affect each other. It could be like, it starts with a cost push and then it has a demand pull, right? So the inflation can keep going up in a spiral. That's what exactly happened during the great inflation. What happened there was the natural rate of unemployment, this line, was always higher than the real unemployment. Meaning, people here at this point, uh, more people were employed, right? It should be here, but it was here. So more people were employed for a long period of time. And so then what happened was inflation keep building up and up and up, right? There's only like one year here where there were like more people unemployed than it should be. Um, but then it was always at the negative side. So this is where the inflation built up in the 1970s. And uh, that led to inflation spiral. So one of these, right, I believe it was a cost push inflation that led to the demand pull inflation and keep going up, up, up. Until Paul Walker came in as like, hey, I'm gonna in increase the federal fund rate like 20%, right? Like it went up like really high, then got the inflation back under control. But, but we realize now how inflation can be a spiral or a cost push inflation starting from the supply side or the demand side from demand pull inflation. But in a sense, right, monetary phenomena. So Mitchell Friedman, right, he said that inflation is always a, a monetary phenomena. So in a sense, what he's saying is that, hey, you can with MP curve shifting up and down, we saw that, right? Monetary easing is MP curve going down, right? So MP1 to MP2, monetary easing. For the same inflation, you're reducing the interest, real interest rate. And then if it goes up, MP goes up, MP3, that's monetary tightening, right? For the same inflation, you're gonna have to pay higher real interest rate. So if, if MP goes up and down, you can change. So if it MP goes down, it's monetary easing, interest rate goes down. When interest rate goes down, the demand goes up. The demand goes up. We just saw what happens, right? The supply follows, the supply goes up. Output, you know, uh, it, it, it stabilizes around the potential output. The output, total output doesn't go up because that's your potential output. But demand went up. When demand goes up, the overall output can increase, right? Temporarily, which we saw, but that certainly increases inflation, right? This is temporary, this is permanent. So easy monetary policy just led to an increase in inflation, right? But the key thing to remember is that R star, the equilibrium real rate of return and Y star, the output potential, Y star or equals YP, they are not impacted by monetary policy because as we saw here, Inflation went up, but like it came back to YP, came back to YP. And in, in, in both of these cases, we've seen in the previous video, the R star went up independent of I, right? So monetary policy cannot impact real 
interest rate and cannot impact the total output. Both of these are a combination as we've seen in the previous chapters, combination only impacted by savings and investments, not by monetary policy, right? So now the final topic of this chapter, which is like, what happens? What happens when, you know, when your I equals zero, right? When you are at a zero bound, what happens? When, when you can no longer go below zero, right? When I equals zero, right? What happens here? So when I equals zero, the NP curve, we know NP curve is upward sloping, right? We've seen here. But at the zero bound, which is let's say here, the MP curve is no longer upward sloping, but it's downward sloping. So that's the key. And the AD curve, which we know demand is always downward sloping, but also becomes upward sloping post zero bound. Right? So, and why is that the case? How does this intuitively make sense? So let's take an example, right? We're going to use this, we're going to use this equation. We know I equals R plus pi. You know that from the previous chapters, right? Real interest rate plus inflation equals the federal fund rate, which we also saw here, I equals R plus pi. And so then R, real interest rate, I minus pi, it's just I'm just arranging this. So now let's say I equals zero, right? I equals zero is basically saying Federal Reserve interest rate, fund rate zero. So I equals zero. So then what happens? R equals minus pi. So if inflation is 2%, inflation is 2%, real rate of interest is minus 2%, right? So now let's say the inflation goes from pi equals two to pi equals one, meaning it, it fell down further, right? Inflation went from three to two to one. When it goes from three to two to one, interest rate goes from minus two to minus one, but minus two to minus one is an increase. Minus two to minus one is an increase, right? So that's what happens here. So here, right? So if we see these two points, right? The MP curve is upward sloping. And we just saw this when pi equals two, R equals minus two, when pi equals one, right? Pi equals one, R equals minus one. So the R actually goes down. It increases. My, minus one is greater than minus two. It increases, right? So that's where this is increase, right? It's going up instead of going down. Similarly, um, the output actually goes down, right? Because if interest rate increase, output goes down. So the AD curve post 0% interest rate changes. It becomes like this. This is the AD curve. Output actually falls even with a fall of inflation. So output falls and inflation falls when this happens. So the self-correcting mechanism is no longer working, right? And so is there a solution to this? The solution to this is, is going to be created, right? So how did, so, so, so yeah, this curve here, right, is, is, is what combines these two, right? Uh, it falls from one to two inflation falls, output falls, right? So the solution to this is gonna be created and it comes from this equation that we've seen in the previous videos, Ri equals R plus F. F is the financial friction. So if the Federal Reserve can somehow figure out how to shift my AS curve up or how do I shift um, my overall AD curve to the right, then they can figure out that, hey, they can actually move this away from this negative spiral, away from the zero bound into something more healthy that can course correct. So what they do is they, there are three different ways. One is inflation expectation, where you basically say, hey, you're gonna set guidance, expectation management that says, hey, I'm gonna set guidance that, hey, I'm gonna target for this inflation. So when you do that, you're automatically, your AS curve shifts up. So it, it moves from one to two. When your AS curve shifts up, it automatically now, you know, your output just went up, right? Your output went from Y1 to YP. So your output goes up when you set expectations. So if, if the Federal Reserve's um, expectation setting of inflation target, if people believe them, 
the way they do it, the, their actions, they are the consistent with the follow through, then that automatically shifts the AS curve up. That has a huge impact to bring this increase in output, increase in inflation. But at the same time, quantitative easing or asset purchases or liquidity through those segments that really are in crunch, let's say the financial crisis, there's a huge liquidity crunch. What they can do, they can change the AD curve and shift it right by providing them the liquidity, by buying their purchases. When they do that, they are actually reducing the F part, the friction part of the uh, real interest rate. Real interest rate is R plus F. They're reducing F in all of these equations. So then the AD curve shifts. So it goes, it goes from becoming this to this, right? So it shifts up. So 0.1 becomes 0.2. It increases output, increases inflation from here to here. So these are some ways in which even post the zero bound, that was the biggest takeaway. The biggest takeaway is even post the zero bound, the Federal Reserve has many instruments to, to help us control this issue where output falls, inflation falls, they can actually increase output, increase inflation, and get back to the steady state of everything else that we've seen in the previous set of videos. So I hope that was useful, really interesting to understand how the Federal Reserve works. Why can't we not apply it? There's so many issues. What kinds of inflation exist today? Demand pull, supply push. And uh, Taylor equation, also learn about how overheating versus wage efficiency comes into play and how monetary phenomena is always what causes the inflation because, you know, the Federal Reserve can target with this monetary easing or they can target with monetary tightening certain inflation targets. So it's definitely the role of the Federal Reserve and it helps us to understand how they work. Thank you.